Okay, so transporting the time of COVID update 12th of January. And this is the last issue from me with Duff Broadband. So next week will be full of animations and all kinds of stuff happening. All right. And so do send me on that address, chair rdrf at aol.com, any uh, requests you have for the slides uh, or links and any information you want to give me. And uh, this week's theme, I refer to two important people. OK, so the first one is my friend, someone I'm delighted to call a friend, Maya Hillman. Um, and I brought up a, a page for Maya because of last week's uh, presentation by Lucy on independent children's mobility, to give it a kind of professional uh, 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 term. Um, Maya started being interested in independent children's mobility in the late 1960s. In fact, he uh, started his career, he was an architect, and he was concerned about the design plans for Milton Keynes, went to a meeting and uh, they were talking about how everybody was going to be driving around. And he said, how about children? And they just thought of children as people who would be taken around in cars, uh, maybe use the occasional bus. Um, he wrote with John Adams and John Whiteleg, One False Move, a study of children's independent mobility, which uh, showed how this had declined with the rise in motorization and uh, how, of course, a lot of supposedly good looking uh, road safety figures uh, masked the fact that there were just simply fewer children out there walking and cycling. Um, that's what he uh, is well known uh, or should be well known about for many of you, but also lots of stuff about sustainability, particularly over the last few years on climate change, where he takes uh, actually quite a, a, a pessimistic view, I'm afraid to say. Uh, well, I'm not afraid to say, I mean, I'm afraid that uh, things look bad. He does emphasize that. Here's a picture of him on his famous bike. Um, unfortunately, he sold that last year. He's 89 now and in not brilliant health. Um, I do try to see him when I can, but he's been shielding for the last year. Uh, he's had one jab and is due to have another jab this week. Um, and he's been very good on loads and loads of stuff. And you can see just some of the things that he's contributed to uh, on his website there. So I'm sure a lot of you know about Mayor Hillman, but those of you who don't, he is a, a forefather of the active travel, sustainable travel movement. OK, that's the first special person. Right, news. Um, uh, Here's, sorry, uh, here's, there was a lovely piece on BBC News about Pedal Me app in London, running a taxi service for vulnerable people. Uh, here's a cancer patient who's been taken by Pedal Me to hospital. Uh, they are only in London at the moment, but they are an excellent organisation run by the very good Ben Knowles. Do uh, keep yourself aware of what they're doing. It'd be great to see them uh, popping up in other cities in uh, Britain. Uh, here's another the repeat of the slide on uh, uh, the traffic uh, action network crowd uh, justice page. Uh, they are going to be fighting against the roads building program and do uh, keep on being in touch with what they're doing. Okay, here's some, uh, uh, I'm just trying to get rid of this. Uh, um, yeah, I can't do that. Anyway, there's a great new thesis on uh, senses of speed when travel, uh, traveling that Max Glaskin gave me. Um, it's about how cyclists feel they get to work quickly and motorists feel they don't which is a big thing about why people choose to cycle when they can. Uh, next point, uh, don't forget the Police and Crime Commissioner elections in May. 
uh, we as Road Danger Reduction Forum, along with Road Peace and others, are going to be uh, setting up some sort of manifesto about that. We have a uh, webinar on January 21st, which you should come to if you can. Um, there's another webinar here for people in South London uh, about active travel, uh, a lot of emphasis on diversity there. And the national lockdown guidance is there. Uh, if you want to look at the basis for any genuine concern about people cycling for long distances. Um, next consultation, public consultation open for suggested changes to the offence of using a handheld mobile phone whilst driving. And you need to do that this week. Uh, nice article by Mark uh, on cargo cycles good piece in the blog on London cycling campaign on recent trends and developments. Gold standard cycling, that's a new website, go to it and they'll tell you what they're about. They're trying to talk about uh, gold standard in cycling infrastructure and uh, do take a look at it and they, it's self-explanatory. Just out is a school streets report from Mums for Lungs we can see that the proportion of schools benefiting from school streets could increase to two thirds if accompanied with wider measures. And they also talk about the need uh, to uh, have part six of, uh, of Traffic Management Act 2004 activated so that people outside London can use uh, cameras, et cetera. Uh, there's a new uh, document from Brighton and Hove Council the uh, it's the plans for the, for the uh, uh, next steps with regard to climate change and they are talking about the aim of having a car free city centre that came out a couple of days ago haven't read through it yet but do take a look particularly if you're around that area uh, Rachel Aldred's paper with her colleagues uh, on the impact of introducing low traffic neighbourhoods on road casualties is here Okay, and now the very boring non-story, uh, Boris Bike Ride Gate, uh, which you will have come across very boring non-story. Um, and uh, some people really do seem to think that seven miles on a bicycle is uh, a, a long bike ride. It isn't. One of the ministers in this article here says the 70 mile bike ride is okay. Um, Today, I saw what the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police had said, and she said, no, he wasn't breaking the law. Um, the guidance stresses keeping it local, but the regulations don't specify a distance. So he was not breaking the law. And a nice tweet today from Vince Cable, remember him? Uh, can't people grasp, uh, George Monbiot in that case, grasp that cycling by Boris Johnson or anyone else is good for fitness, mental health and the environment and does nothing whatever to spread COVID. Grow up. Yes, um, that's against people trying to find something wrong with what the Prime Minister was doing on his bike. And there may be plenty of things he's done wrong, but that's not one of them. Okay, wild analogy section. This is from the people in Chiswick. They're writing to the, the PM and leader of our position to say that the defenseless middle class is under attack from the occupying forces of the council whose secret weapon is the cycle lane, and it will end in violent confrontations. God, they're pathetic. Uh, right, a nice uh, thread from Adam Tranter, the Coventry cycling person. Uh, and this is a quote from him. The more time I spend researching planning applications, the more dismayed I become. It seems possible to get literally anything passed if you use copy and pasted charts on promoting active travel. And he refers to a transport assessment for a drive through restaurant where they say it's considered the site is accessible by walking, cycling, public transport and offers significant opportunities for sustainable modes of travel and you know what you have to do to get past the planners is to have i've seen this so many times in my career things which are you know quite good like promoting buddy schemes and setting up bicycle user groups 
but I mean, basically, it's just a load of, of, of flannel just to get through stuff which is not sustainable. Uh, anyway, do have a look at his thread. Uh, okay, bit of physics coming up. Physics, physics, physics. There's a uh, this very nice uh, graphic here. And it's all about how kinetic energy increase on Im dispersed on impact or potential kinetic energy dispersed on impact increases as the square of velocity. So uh, if you hit at 20 miles an hour, it's like falling out of a first floor. At 30 miles an hour, falling out of a third floor, and at 40 miles an hour, out of a sixth floor. It doesn't go one, two, three, it goes one, three, six. It increases as the square of velocity. However, mass is also important. It increases the potential kinetic energy dispersed upon impact, um, but uh, in a linear way, not as the square of mass. So here's an illustration from John Owen, looking at these two cars. The BMW on the left will involve dispersing about 66 kilojoules of kinetic energy at 25 miles an hour, and the one on the right, 150 kilojoules. So it's not four times more, but twice as much. And as he says, I know which I'd rather be hit by. So it's mass and more important, velocity. End of physics lesson. There's a diversity page, nothing new for that. The delay slide is now the what's happening slide. Nothing heard about Active Travel England or Part 6 Road Traffic Act 2004. I'm going to keep on putting that slide up until something does happen. Right, on the ground in the UK, this is Greater Manchester, Levens Human Burnage Living Streets. There's a lot of vandalism. Here are the good guys replacing the planters. Uh, and they're out saying residents have been out again to restore filters that have been vandalized. This evening, a large truck is going around the neighborhood rowing planters. And they ask Manchester City Council to do something. I think the council has done something. And certainly Chris Boardman has been saying anti-LTN vandals won't intimidate us. So read the article he did uh, there in Manchester Evening News reported in Road CC. So that's uh, Greater Manchester uh, pushback, but pushback against the pushback from local residents. And in Shropshire, uh, the council say, due to the current lockdown, the daily closure of the high street in Shrewsbury won't be implemented. Uh, and so it's going to be open to traffic as motor traffic as, as normal. And so they're actually only thinking about reducing motor traffic when lockdown restrictions are eased. The whole point was to have them when there is a lockdown. Okay, now, um, bit London heavy today, but let's look at London. Uh, there's some cycle stands going out of primary school in Westminster. Um, that's gonna be changed a bit with various arrangements for getting more kids to school by bike. Uh, Camden, now quite a few developments there. I've talked about the segregated tracks on Gower Street and Bloomsbury Street, open just before Christmas. And the general opinion of uh, Camden Cycling Campaign, who I'm quoting, and Linus Riesk, is the addition of three quarters of a mile of protected inner London network is a gain. There are problems at the junctions um, and uh, ba the banned left turns and separate cycle phases were ruled out by TfL after modeling. Uh, now look at the picture. Uh, you may be familiar, those of us who are familiar with Tottenham Court Road, is that there's been uh, a, a, a cycle track there for a left turn there and a straight on there with signals, which has been faffed around uh, with for uh, well over a year. And uh, that's being redesigned with works throughout January and hopefully something will be sorted there. Hounslow, here's a nice picture of Jeremy Vine on his penny farthing saying thank you for the uh, cycle uh, lane with wands. 
down Chiswick High Street or whatever high street it is in Chiswick. Uh, thank you, and it's very good. Um, I, as you know, I'm not a big fan of bi-directionals. I like monodirectionals, and someone will no doubt be saying, oh, what was that scientist doing there? We spend all this money and they're in the wrong place. They're not uh, being pushed around like we want them to be. Uh, anyway, nice to see Jeremy Vine. Um, now, here's some graphics from Waltham Forest. Uh, it's the cycle counters, and it's the average number of cyclists on a weekday. It's important because, as you know, there's been increases in cycling in various places dramatically at weekends, uh, but we're more or less at the same numbers as we were on weekdays uh, because of various things, not least working from home. And what's interesting here in Waltham Forest, where you have the Mini Holland, uh, is uh, it, this is average number of cyclists across all count sites. And it's showing 2020 in orange here. And what's really interesting is that there's been a quite significant increase July, August, September, October, and November. So that's an interesting graphic. Southwark, uh, this is from today, the Brunswick Park Low Traffic Neighborhood. This was funded by the guys in St. Thomas's charity. Um, don't know how long those uh, Wandy wandy bollards are going to stay there uh yeah that's good to see in one sense uh stressing the health connection although i don't see why charities should be doing this it should come out of either public money or preferably from motorists directly since they're uh, the reason for needing them okay and now we're on to kensington and chelsea uh, where we spend so much time. Right, now as you probably know, and you can go to that link there, uh, the leader of Kensington Chelsea, Chelsea Council has said, I've asked the council to look again at the decision to remove the temporary cycle lanes on Kensington High Street, uh, seeking views and a decision, doing this without the lead member for transport in the interest of fairness and balance. And this will be done in March. Um, now you can take different views on this, that uh, apparently the judicial review, which was threatened is now uh, redundant. I'm not sure about the legal basis for that, but it could be seen as the fact that there was just so much pressure, so much information about the council behaving, shall we just say less than properly, uh, that uh, they have been forced into this position. Um, if you're cynical, you can say they'll be kicking the can down the road and hoping that people have forgotten about it by uh, March. Just a quick point, if you look at the red uh, there, this is my um, quick analysis of the first hundred or so replies uh, to the tweet about this. And most were happy with the news that it was being, the, the taking out was going to be reconsidered. Uh, so that's a bit positive. Um, what you have to look at is better streets for uh, RBKC. They are the main lobby group. And I just want to read from what they've said here. Uh, they said, we last wrote to you to know that, uh, to, to let you know that the Environmental Law Foundation had submitted a revised pre-action pr protocol for judicial review. Uh, contain a number of grounds for potential claim, 26 page comprehensive explanation of unlawfulness for the council's removal of the lanes. Uh, uh, we have now had the reply in, in terms of that letter. Uh, and they say, we are far from complacent. While we, we would love to believe in the good faith of all, Having seen firsthand what has happened in recent months, we are naturally suspicious that this is no more than an attempt to avoid public scrutiny of a judicial review. And they're considering their response with the Environmental Law Foundation and barristers who gave pro bono advice. Um, and uh, they refer to the fact the removal of lanes was done through a special urgency, not even normal urgency procedure of the council, rushed through two hours before a council meeting and why do they now take over two months to have a meeting to discuss its reinstatement so they say you've got to keep on supporting them 
please spread the word, which is what I'm doing. Join them here and keep on uh, uh, emailing and writing to Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea to say you want the lanes back. Uh, so um, keep in touch with Better Streets for RBKC. And I think that is actually relevant for everybody in, um, in Britain, actually, not just London. And it does show how it does help to have a, a high quality lobbying group uh, acting in with a, a good knowledge of the law and all the relevant factors. Okay, so uh, I, as I promised next week, I'm going to just rush over the reading because I hope to get it up on the RDRF website. And we'll go straight. And so uh, going on to this final page, keep up the momentum of active travel uh, funding this year. Look at the road safety lobby. Look at drivers paying. Look at law enforcement and more this year with us here on Ideas with Beers. And my final page is for my second important guy. And uh, this is because of his very important uh, speech, which has been seen by about you know, several million people. Uh, and it's from Arnie. And do look at his message to my fellow Americans and friends around the world uh, following this week's attack on the Capitol. It's about his background uh, growing up in post-war Austria. It's about fascism. It, it's important to look at. And I like seeing Arnie on a bicycle. There he is on a Santander bike. There's he on his fat tired uh, e-bike. And there he is with a wonderful grater. And he's very good at not riding, a helmet, riding with a helmet and telling off people like the Australians who want him to. So good for him riding lidless and good old Arnie and do read his, his thing about um, the assault on the Capitol. So uh, there we go. And uh, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. How can I stop sharing? There we go. So, um, uh, I don't know if anybody's got any uh, kind of questions or anything they want to ask. Any points of order as well? Um, so. I've, got, I've got to go at six. Go so on. I wanted to just, so just, Bob, thanks for referring to the Brighton Climate Assembly. We've just literally had a, a transport partnership in Brighton before this meeting, which was talking about it. And I think what's important to note, and if Adam's here, uh, Adam Tranter, but what's really important to note is that this was, a hundred, sorry, 50 people who were demographically selected. So it wasn't a consultation in the sense of what do you want to see for transport in Brighton? There was something like 7,000 applicants and it was whittled down and it was the biggest climate assembly, the biggest response to any consultation apparently that there's been apart from, I can't remember, there was one other that was bigger per capita. But basically these 10 um, headline calls for things like a car free city centre have come from normal people not from um, people like us, but normal people who were selected to represent the, the public of Brighton demographically. So, you know, 53 women, so many old, older people. And there was an extra people put in from BME and disability groups to just because otherwise the numbers would have been too low. And that's what they came up with. But they came up with those proposals after listening to a detailed explanation from people like um, I think Glenn Lyons, uh, Jill Annable, Professor Jill Annable. So, so from listening, I don't even know if Roger spoke to it, Roger Geffen, but, but people who were academics and experts were speaking to them, so they weren't just subject to the sort of knee-jerk media stuff. And what it shows is that if people, if, if the time is spent to explain things to people, they had four sessions, four hour-long sessions, so they had to have a commitment. But if people are prepared to have things explained to them, even if they start from a position of not knowing anything about anything to do with transport, they tend to come to the right conclusion. And the problem obviously is trying to put the, put the arguments in, in a coherent and sensible way, which people can then listen to and getting them to listen to it for sufficiently long time to persuade them that we're saying the right things. But, but the, the officers were really wary and the councillors because they said, what happens if they all say, you know, we want to ban cycling and, and build motorways. And, and they were persuaded that the risk was worth taking. And, and clearly the results are that it was. Wouldn't mind covering that as a topic one week, Mark. That's a... Well, I'm sure I could get one of the officers um, to, to talk about how it was done, if you're yeah, interested. Um, I think Laura, do you know Laura Wells? 
Roger stuck yeah. in there as Laura. She used to work yeah. this other. So Laura was, I think, leading on that. So she might be prepared if she we could persuade her to talk about it. Oh, um, I just, just want to take uh, away before you run off. Come I on. did. Um, I did actually refer to some of the the, the UK wide climate assembly, and I reckon that it, it was calling. Um, it, it didn't want to really reduce car and and. Um, uh, motor vehicle usage to any notable extent, you know, odd bits and pieces about uh, not having SUVs, but not really wanting to uh, cut motor traffic by more than kind of like one percent or something like that. So nationally, it's not that brilliant, but you know, good to hear from Brighton. Well, I'm going to take a risk and let um, Dave Holiday come in with his question, but try and be quick, Dave. And if you start all equine, I'm just going to well, mute you. <laughs> uh, one thing, Brian, the, um, look, remember seeing a heat map of uh, RTCs with cyclists on um, Holland Park Avenue and Kensington High Street. And I know I've had one or two alarming things, particularly where that Italian guy got crushed. I nearly got taken out by a couple of chipper trucks just crashing the lights. Um, is there anything we can do in seeing what um, Kensington and uh, RBKC are doing on uh, following through on RTCs, you know, um, improving road safety by following up investigations on serious crashes. Because we, we seem to have a really red hot spot of crashes along those two corridors when you look at the routes. Mm. Hold them to account on that. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, nothing will actually happen in the next three months because if you want to follow through results, these take, you know, can take a couple of years. Um, I mean, just get in touch directly with them and, you know, raise suggestions. Yeah, I just say NFOI, what's your Section 39 reports and are you doing anything about them, basically? Because mm. there have been, I, I think there's been. A few fatalities along that, because I can you know Alien is the uh, uh, Italian guy that got crushed by the truck, and I think there's a few yeah. others. We need to map that out. Yeah. It, it's be... not one of the worst, though, I will say. Yeah. A... No, true. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't like, uh, anyway, yeah, no, it's, it's a good point, though. No, definitely uh, safety is a good way to get people's attention. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll move on now, because we've got quite a few people to talk about. Um, uh, Sally, are you here? Want to do your update? Hi. Yeah, I'm Hello. here. Can you hear me? Hello. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be pretty brief tonight um, because I just want to draw everyone's attention to something that I don't, I'm, I missed the very beginning of Bob's update, but I don't think he mentioned, mm -hmm. which is an open letter um, that's been sent that, that, that's been sent to the UK government, but also uh, alongside it, there is a template for you to write to your MP. Uh, and this has been put together by um, a coalition of play advocates and led by uh, Playing Out, I think. So I'm gonna copy and paste that link into the chat. And the reason I think it's really important that, that this sort of becomes more than just about play is that we we work very much in silos where we where we have a co we have play advocates um, who are advocating for for play on streets and then we have people talking about cycling and we have people talking about walking and and I just uh, think wherever possible we need to start thinking about these things as all being much more interrelated um, and just sort of in relation to that, so this is this is talking about outdoor play for children who we are imagining are not able to be independently mobile or, or, or travel with friends. So, you know, under the age of, depending on where you are, probably um, sort of 10 or 13. And, um, and that just picks up on something that we talked about last week. I was talking about children and looking for children in policy and somebody uh, mentioned that actually, of course, you know, chill, chill, it's not just children, children are, or children divide up into different age groups. And I just wanted to pick up on that. And that is a really, really good point. And, and, and ultimately children in law, anybody under the age of 18 is a child but obviously somebody who is 17 and a one-year-old um, have are very very different so I think the starting point is that we is that in in sort of policy we're looking at children but then the policy and planning we are thinking about those 
different age groups and and how children are put at risk in different ways or restricted from being able to do things at different ages and um so these things are all joined up but actually just because a child is more able to be mobile and you know most 13 plus children are much more able to to be independently mobile or travel alone with with friends um, they are actually the, the group that are most at risk because they are actually still just about able to or we, ha we allow them to do so. Um, so I'm, I'll copy the link to this to this letter uh, in the chat and, and it would be really fantastic if we could also get lots of people who are involved in, in more the transport side of things uh, to also be because you might want to personalise this letter and say as a transport professional or advocate or whatever it is that you, that you, you know your role um, that that's really key that and, and the reason that it's really important is that in politicians minds it starts to connect up the idea of children having uh, rights to, to, to their street um, and being visible in their street and that streets are not just about moving traffic so it's really really important for you know if you're a, a decision maker if you're a politician you're not necessarily keyed into these debates and you're not necessarily making those links so the more of us who across a sort of wider um, professional or, or, or advocacy backgrounds who are making this point the better and that's all I've got to say thank you and you said it eloquently, and I hope we all do it. Um, thanks for that. Has anybody got any um, points to raise with Sally or questions? What makes sense? I think like silence says ringing endorsements. That's <laughs> I'm going to too long. All right, we'll move on to like our, our big guest, uh, Rod King. Now, Rod, are you there? Let's hope he is. Can you unmute yourself if you're there? So Hello. Rod, are you in the house? Hmm. I did see him, Brian, and he just yeah, disappeared. Oh. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you. You can. Yeah, there we go, Rod. Yeah, long time now, see. Right. Yes, it's. Uh... Amazing first time I've been here and uh, just looking around the um, virtual room, I, I see so many faces from uh, um, lots of uh, different times in the uh, in in the past. So it's uh, it, it, it's really uh, really good to be here and uh, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. I sorry, are you? Oh yeah, I think I thought you had some slides. I was just going to let you say the floor. I'm always terrible at doing introductions, so I just like oh, the, the floor is yours. But we are going to talk about intelligent speed assistance, so I'm I'm all raring to go with all the uh, the issues. Uh, I've definitely been quite positive about this one, but uh, um, which because it, it is positive. But anyway, I'll let you talk about it first. Okay, I'm I'm going to talk about it. I, I don't go have any uh, uh, slides, but oh. what I will be uh, releasing. We do have some information uh, on our website, so I'll. I'll put that in the, the comments uh, later. Um, a, a lot of you know, know me, um, just to recap 20s plenty for us, we have 500 local campaigns around the world. And today we added Salt Lake City. So uh, that's, that's uh, another one added. And we campaign for 20 mile an hour or 30 kilometers per hour as a default speed limit. Um, and it's only how we're proven safe for uh, vulnerable road users. Um, our current campaign is very much challenging Shire counties on their speed management strategies. You'll be aware that most of uh, the unitary authorities uh, and conurbation do get um, lower speed limits much, much better. Um, we're now having 20 question zooms on the 20th of month at 20 hundred hours, if any of you want to uh, uh, to come into to that. Um, well, when I'm talking about 20 mile an hour limits in presentations or whatever, I almost invariably get the uh, uh, question, well, who's going to enforce these 20 mile an hour limits? Um, well, up until now, I've been saying that you can do it like Avon and Somerset, who in 2018 actually issued 25,000 um, notices of intended prosecution on 20 mile an hour streets. Uh, which is brilliant, but not many are doing that. But in 2022, I will be saying to that question, who enforces 20 mile an hour limits? 
well, it's going to be BMW, Audi, Jaguar, Volkswagen, Ferrari, because every one of these manufacturers will be putting things in their cars, which will be helping to enforce 20 mile an hour limits. And that is uh, intelligent speed uh, assistance. Uh, it's been mandated by the EU and that has been accepted uh, also uh, that that will be in, in, in UK cars as well. It's in all new models from 2022. That's a, a model which is launched from 2022. Uh, and it will be required on all new cars sold from uh, 2023. And what it will do is provide, first of all, a visual indication of the limit right on the uh, dashboard. So there'll be no excuse for not knowing what speed limit a driver is in. It will both use GPS and the current uh, limit from a, a database, but also it will use cameras which are, if you like, sighting speed limit signs. So those signs at the side of the road with the red wrangle, uh, those will be used to detect the, uh, uh, the speed uh, uh, limit. A um, few questions uh, uh, um, about that. How does it uh, work? Well, it will do so just by limiting the, the speed so you won't be able to go up through uh, the uh, uh, speed limit, which is uh, active uh, at that time for that, that place. A few questions. Can it be overridden? Yes, it can. But it resets every journey. And uh, that, that's an important uh, uh, issue, which we'll come to uh, uh, later. Uh, but it is overridable, right? So it, it doesn't, it, it, uh, a car can still be driven faster than the, the speed limit. Will a vehicle brake when it gets into a lower speed limit? No, but it will reduce the uh, power going to the uh, wheels, which will mean it won't accelerate or maintain that, 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 that speed. Uh, so uh, it, it will effectively cap the, the speed at whatever the uh, limit is. Can you buy a car already fitted with uh, 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 ISA? Well, yes. In fact, uh, we happen to have a Honda Jazz, which is five years old, a perfectly standard model, and it has ISA built into it. Right, it's optional, you set it uh, and it uh, goes. So um, you can actually buy cars already fitted, and I would say a, a fair proportion of new cars are having them fitted at, at the moment. Um, cost, it adds around £50 to the uh, uh, cost of the vehicle. I think a very important aspect of this, this is the first time that we've had infrastructure on speed management, which is being paid for out of the private purse of motorists rather than public funds. So. This is very different from saying, putting something which is physical infrastructure to uh, manage the speed of uh, vehicles and councils having to pay for it. It's actually being paid for by the drivers themselves, right? Uh, when they uh, purchase the uh, uh, vehicle. Um, I think some of the uh, way in which it's worked it will have a direct influence on drivers. It will no longer be possible to drift over the speed limit, to accidentally, in quotes, just rise above the, the, the speed limit. That is something which the system will not allow you to do unless you choose to override it. And that will enhance speed compliers. Those people who want to comply with speeds will find it easier to do so and have steadier journeys right uh, within the uh, speed limit. The fact that you've got to make a conscious action to override it, right, is you could say, well, OK, that's a, that's a disbenefit, but that will be recorded. And I think that's an important issue. If you have a crash and 
you are going faster than the speed limit, that will be recorded through data logging uh, requirements, which come in at the same time as speed limiters, right? And that will record the fact that you have overridden uh, the uh, uh, ISA. And I think there is a, a question that in time that could well be used in civil liability cases, may not come into in criminal uh, prosecutions, but certainly in civil liability, there may be a case for identifying uh, that a, a vehicle was well over the, the, the speed limit. Um, surveys and tests have shown that drivers prefer it, right, that it seems that it's something which is positive uh, for the majority of, uh, of drivers. Indirectly, um, cars which are fitted with it may not necessarily be in a majority, but they will become pace cars. Think of them as rolling speed bumps. They will be the people who have got ISA fitted and their drivers really don't want to override it. It's not worth the hassle. I'm just going to, you know, drive at the, the, the speed limit. And I think there will also be a change in the relationship with the police because it will only be non-compliers who are speeding. It will not be the person who's actually accidentally drifted over. You know, that law-abiding motorist, right, who uh, 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 is mythically never does any um, uh, offences at all, right? So I think it will enable the police to say, the people who are speeding are really have made a conscious decision to do so and will have them, right? And I think that is a subtle change, but I think it will, 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 will come through. Um, a few issues about it. Um, it is going to be applied in the UK, uh, even though UK is outside of the EU, that has been uh, confirmed. Uh, could it change? Who knows, right? But it seems unlikely that you will be building um, cars of a much lower specification, right, for uh, the UK uh, market. Could it get watered down in the EU? Uh, possibly there is lobbying from the uh, motor manufacturers who actually would prefer uh, just to have a visual indication on the uh, dashboard that you're breaking the speed limit. But I, I think seeing the way in which the uh, EU see this as such a big uh, improvement for road safety, I, I can't see that being uh, accepted. The wider implications of it, it, it really does enable appropriate speed limits to be set. Uh, you, you may be aware that the, the, the Stockholm Declaration um, uh, resolved to set 30 kilometer per hour speed limits as a, as a default where uh, motor vehicles mix with uh, pedestrians and cyclists. That was endorsed by the UN General Assembly it's been built into the UN Global Road Safety um, uh, Week and second decade of action on road safety. Uh, the EU is promoting default uh, 30 kilometers per hour limits and nationally that is already being set by, by Spain and the Netherlands have it in a legal process at the moment to set a 30k uh, default and the whole of Brussels uh, city has been set at, at at 30 kilometers per hour from, from January the, the 1st. So there's a lot of movement towards setting urban speed limits at 30 kilometers per hour uh, 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 rather than, than higher. One other issue is that will make any previous compliance stats obsolete because any compliance statistics from the past will have been done without ISA. So we can expect ISA to radically change the, the, the compliance which, which there is. Um, other wide issues, expect pushback from the motoring lobby. This will be seen as a, a huge imposition on the freedom to uh, break the speed limit. Um, uh, and uh, you know that should be uh, uh, resisted, but we should expect that from the, the likes of the uh, Alliance of British Drivers uh, and so on. Uh, but most importantly, it, it does allow 
uh, speed limits to be maintained and Clark complied with much better uh, than otherwise. Uh, I'm not sure if that explanation was uh, what was uh, um, expected, but hopefully I've, I've given you all a, a, a little bit more information and I'll, within the comments, I'll put the link to um, our webpage, which provides uh, 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 more information uh, as well. Yeah, that was brilliant, Rod. A, a really good uh, overview, I think. Uh, that there was a couple of questions I wanted to ask, but I'll, I'll be nice and let other people come in. Uh, Kate, you had quite a good one. Now's the time to pose it to, to Rod. Yeah, um, I posted the link, the ETSE link in the chat um, for anybody who wants to see it. So um, I just didn't know whether you knew what the current status is of the move to make it only an alert system. So Germany, as I understand it, as a surprise, is leading the move to make it alert only with no override at all. Uh, well, I think that's a lobbying from the, the, the yeah, the German car manufacturers. Uh, I, from what I pick up from the, the, the EU Commission, they put a huge amount of effort over the, the years into um, establish just what level of ISA there is going to uh, to be, uh, and I think they're going to stick with it. Uh, it's it's within a package of other measures which there are, uh, and I I don't think it it is going to be uh, diluted. I, I agree with you. I think I think we'll start to see an in, an insurance leverage. We're expecting quite big user behaviour once people know everything's detected. Um, there'll be nowhere to hide. The problem is at the moment, the manufacturers refuse to disclose the data to the police. So uh, the um, police authorities say potentially a third of all fatalities could result in a prosecution, but don't because they don't have the data to prove it. So only a very small proportion do. Yeah. I think it will be the existence of the, both the ISA and the, uh, and the data uh, uh, loggers coming together. And of course, you can't push for the evidence to be used if the evidence isn't there because data loggers aren't fitted. So I think we're, we're, we're going to see a, 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 a gradual uh, campaign up by many people, inc including the insurance companies, to actually say, well, let's get this data and use it for civil liability rather than necessarily for criminal liability. Thank you. Uh, can I have a question? Oh, I think Ruth is first. Go on, yeah, Ruth first, and I'll come to Bob, and I think we've got Charles. Go on then, Ruth. Such a gentleman, Robert. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Rod, great presentation. I was in America about five years ago, my partner was driving, and he, because it's only 55 miles an hour on those highways, or whatever they're called, he set the car at that, you could set it on um, cruise control, and then if he started to go over it, literally his foot was almost pushed back up, remind him that he'd gone over the cruise control. So I'm just wondering what's the difference and is it similar to what you were explaining? Thank you. I don't think it pushes back. I don't think there's the haptic feedback uh, there, right? Uh, so I think it will, it will stop you drifting up. It will just limit the, limit the power uh, uh, to the engine, right? As, uh, as far as I'm aware. So, uh, um, yeah, it's not quite the same. But so it sort of still exists, already exists, and therefore it, this is just a development on something that does work or appeared to work. Oh, it 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 is. I mean, this is this this has been tested and developed, you know, for about at least the last ten years, right? So it, it's not a an instant development. But what we've seen is the technology is meant that is much, now much cheaper. Right. Plus, we have the things like the GPS and the um, uh, and the the cameras to detect the speeds, which make it much easier to deploy ISA. Whereas before, it needed a lot of very sophisticated and expensive uh, equipment. Thank you. From Bob. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Leach gave a, a good presentation on uh, speed reduction and uh, the RDRF Road Piece webinar 
um, that we uh, ran last year. So that's actually available. Uh, go to our the Road Danger Reduction Forum website to have a look at that. Um, uh, two points. Firstly, the whole thing about using dash cams. Uh, can you tell us what the latest is with regard to using dash cams and being able to uh, have speeding in there as something which can be reported? Um, uh, that's, that's the first point because a lot of stuff can't be like reporting, yeah. And uh, the other thing is that I always tell people that, that ordinary Germans, even though they're, they're car fanatics, um, are kind of, you know, there is a general acceptance of the 30 kph limit in, in residential areas. I mean, is that true? Would you say that? I mean, because that's relevant to the whole thing about uh, whether there's pushback on ISAs and so on. So there's two questions there, really. I think there are issues uh, uh, about the uh, uh, dash cams. I think they are being accepted, certainly from my involvement, which I've had with 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 police. Right, there does seem to be increasing uh, acceptance of dash cams. But I've also picked up that one of the problems is processing the information, because it's one thing to be given dash cam information, but then if it's going to take a an hour of police time to in order to analyze that in order yeah. to make a, a, a case then you, you you're going to have a huge backlog of, of of evidence which you cannot process yeah so i think there are some issues around that but i do see a from what i've picked up with with police forces around the the, the country yes a, a, an increasing acceptance that evidence like that can be used if it can be processed effectively and i think that's mm -hmm. the that's the key to it right um with regard to 30 kilometers per hour um i think this is where the international standard which has come out of the stockholm declaration is so important because it it really does say that that 30 kilometers per hour is that best practice and the other side of that of course is 50 kilometers per hour or 30 miles an hour is no longer fit for purpose as a general speed limit i think that is the it, it is the uh, the aspect there and the gradual norming of that uh as 20 mile an hour i mean we're very much presenting right uh in, in our campaigning how can you justify 30 miles per hour rather than the need to just defy 20. And the more that is done by organizations like the UN Road Safety Council, uh, like WHO, uh, OECD, and so on, then I think it's still it's establishing that best practice norm. Um, and as well, that's being at, at the other end of the spectrum, people are just getting more and more used to seeing 20 mile an hour speed limits, right? mm. uh, which I, I think is changing that norm. Mm. I'll just ask you a quick question while I'm there. So well, like a, my, my understanding of it, and, and yours will be better, is that like you can turn it off. And if you turn it off, does it still register your push throughs? Like, a, does it still log them as a really technical, boring question? I think that will be on the data logger. If you think about the data logger, right, the, it, it will log your speed and record that i think in in so many uh, it, it, it keeps overriding it so it will only have the um the data yeah. before a crash but the, the point is that if it's recorded that you were doing 28 miles an hour in a 20 mile an hour limit then the only way you could have got there is by disabling the 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 isa right so i i think it's a moot point as to it is yeah. to you know whether it's actually recording that the uh, isa is off but i should imagine it is because it is recording a whole set of uh vehicle uh, parameters and i and i can't see that switching the isa off would yeah so i like that so you've consciously turned it off you've done a positive act to then like uh be criminal with that's uh that's good. Uh, i i think that is very powerful with regard to anybody who's going to look at a collision and, uh, and, and who is liable 
it's the, the fact that the, one of the participants in there decided that they were going to exceed the speed limit on that journey. Right. Uh, and I think that's a very powerful uh, moral and legal uh, issue there. Excellent. I think um, Charles wanted to come in with a quick question and we'll move on. I think Adrian's going to pose us some, some further questions. Uh, but Charles, did you want to come in? Charles Barrymore? Oh, no, it was a different Charles, was it Charles King? Well, hey, if you've got a question, Charles, <laughs> by all means, ask it. Slightly off topic, but an amazing public speaker called Rod King was campaigning back in 2010 and made great play of a soft dog toy. Is that still in use? As a, as a soft... Soft dog ploy, I think he said. Soft dog toy. Ah. I can't remember that. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, we'll leave you to think about that one. Adrian, did you want to come in and, and add to the discussion? Yeah. So I, 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 the first question I had was around um, the importance now of, of getting 20 miles an hour in as a default, because if we don't set the right speed limit, which is, I think everyone's agreeing, is, is 20 miles an hour in residential streets and town centres, then, the, then there's nothing to prosecute. There's nothing, um, you know, there's, there's no illegality. So I think that that's that was my you know, sort of first point, is the, the, the urgency of getting 20 miles an hour into default is, is, is now. I, I just wonder whether, given the, um, and I, I think I might know the answer to this, I'm sure I'm going to get shouted down, but given the, um, given the bike clash from tranche one, I just wonder whether we ought to be putting more emphasis on um, getting 20 miles an hour in as the default in towns and cities, rather than trying to implement controversial bike lanes. Um, because in a lot of places, actually 20 miles an hour would enable a lot of walk-in cycling already without the, without the infrastructure. And, that, and I'm sure that lots of people are going to shout about that. One of the, one of the things about about twenty mile an hour, it, it it always resets the 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 standard about how we think about pedestrians and and cyclists, uh, and I and I think that's that's so important. It sensitises whole communities, um, and and I always felt that there is a place for cycling infrastructure. I've not got a problem with cycling infrastructure in any way, shape, or or, or, or form. But what we do need to do is, is, is not marginalize that cycling infrastructure to just some places based on what we can afford or, or whatever. The, the thing about a default 20 mile an hour, and that's what we are talking about, not 20 mile an hour for this road or, or that area or this estate or whatever. It's a 20 mile an hour default, and that's the call, and that's what we were challenging. Uh, council speed management strategies on right it, uh, and that is that it delivers something wide and i always say it's a little bit like um you know you, you can make everybody eat a little bit less and that may have more benefit across the whole community than maybe fitting a few people with gastric bands right so you know wide area 20 mile an hour is, is cheap it's it's cheerful it's it, it, it's not a silver bullet it's the foundation for everything else and it makes everything else easier to uh, uh, to implement and with isa coming in it, it actually um overcomes so many of those objections which there have been uh, it, it, in the past Excellent. I'll, I think I'm going to bring Charles in. It's Charles Carey and, and Dan Lucy. But but I, I just uh, observed that it reminds me of like, I can't remember who said it now, but that we just switched from miles an hour to like kilometres an hour in the UK. Then we've got the 30 signs up everywhere, but ready to go. I just uh, <laughs> had to mention that one. Uh, but Charles Carey, are, are you here? I'm actually sorry, I remembered your second name. Did you have a question? It's the last time I'll bloody go into any of these. Maybe not. Maybe we'll go to Lucy. Oh, on mute. 
Oh, uh, is that better? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Brian. Yeah, uh, Brian gave me the green light just to widen the discussion beyond ISA, uh, and it does relate a little bit to the last question. Um, there was really two points. Rod, uh, you, is there any evidence that, that 20 miles an hour does do away with cycling infrastructure uh, at certain volumes? That was the first question. I don't think it works like that. It, 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 it's not one or, or the, the other, right? Uh, what we, we do find that, that councils who get default 20 mile an hour get cycling infrastructure as well because they're sensitized to, to vulnerable road users. And it, you know, it, it, it's not a case of one or the other. Once you've got that sensitization, right, then the two things fit into place. 20 uh, miles of default everywhere. I'd like, I, I would like to challenge that because cycle infrastructure costs money. And if there was evidence that a road uh, at 20 miles an hour at a certain volume of car traffic uh, could take cyclists, you, you know, count, you save the money of putting in the cycle infrastructure. It, we, we can't do both. Councils don't have the cash. I guess that's something which is down to, to engineers, right, uh, and a site-specific uh, analysis. And I think that that's what we're involved in as 20s Plenty is actually saying you have to have that, that objective of a generic 20 mile an hour limit and only having more than that where it is uh, there's evidence that it will be safe. Now, uh, we don't get into road specific or site specific arguments, right? Therefore, we're not even not really looking at that. And it will depend from, I think, um, council to council, right? Mm. As to how they will respond to them. My, my second point, just uh, quickly related to when I first spoke to you a few weeks ago, Rod, you said we, we uh, your campaign tries not to affiliate just to cyclists, but to, to or to any particular group, um, which I thought was 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 a wise strategy. Um, are, is there sort of evidence to show that large enough communities at, uh, of 20 mile an hour zones have actually got those communities wanting wanting to pull it through for all the benefits of noise uh, and just general movement and safety uh, upon which the whole cycling agenda can benefit as well. At, at the end of the day, we say it's a wide range of benefits which tick the boxes in order to put in 20 mile an hour as a uh, an intervention which maximizes the number of constituents who will, will gain from it. And that's also shown by the degree of support there is, because there's about 70% public support consistently for 20 mile an hour uh, limits. Now, you know, it, people would do that for different, different reasons, whether they cycle or whether they've got an elderly grandmother who wants to walk to the shops, or whether they've got an eight year old who wants to walk to school or cycle uh, to, 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 to school. Uh, but it is that wide range of benef beneficiaries uh, who are actually saying we want this and then when they've got it in post implementation surveys, the support always goes up. Right. So, uh, yes, it is a, a wide range of, uh, of people. And I would say that we're, we're the opposite of most NGOs. Most NGOs think of a group of people which they want to support and then they find all the initiatives which will help them. We find one initiative and we find all the different people that that will support. And I think that's one of the, um, one of the bases of, of our success is that, that we can get that wide support. And if we can align that support which exists to be seen by councillors as constituents, then that's the positive way in which, which we get change. Listen, Lucy, did you want to come in with a question? Comment? Yeah, um, I saw I've missed some of the beginning of this talk, um, but just there seems, I mean, from what I understand about 20s, which I'm all in favour of, but there is a difference between um, cutting casualties and enabling 
uh, walking and cycling. And the evidence, I think, suggests that although 20s are very popular and understandably so, they and they do, you know, there's some evidence that they reduce casualties, they don't actually get people cycling um, because even with lots of, you know, a lot of people, um, well, first of all, 20s aren't very well enforced, but even if, you know, they were all to be enforced, there's still a lot of traffic around. Um, and so the combination of lots of traffic, lack of protected infrastructure, um, all these things still, even with a 20, um, are a sufficient deterrent to people um, to, to get them cycling. So I think the evidence indicates that um, they're popular, they might slow traffic a bit, um, but they don't actually get people cycling from what I've seen. Well, you're, you're right, because, you know, we have evidence that 20 mile now is not a silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet for cyclists. It's not a silver bullet for pedestrians. It's not a silver bullet for emissions or anything else. But can you name one other intervention which is so cheap to put in, which can benefit so, so many groups of people and can be a foundation for so much in terms of creating better communities better places to be and so on and then you ask that question will a road ever be cycle friendly a residential road be cycle friendly for children or for cyclists or for walkers if you endorse motor vehicles traveling at 30 miles an hour on that road that is the, the key question so yeah. whatever way you look at it it's not perfect it's not a silver bullet but if you can't do 20 as a default for, for residential roads, then it's unlikely that you'll get round to doing all the other things which make such a big difference. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like 100% in favour of 20 mile an hour default. Um, but I suppose the other very cheap intervention that a lot of people are looking at is filtering out traffic. But I'm 100% in favour of it. Don't get me wrong. It's yeah. just that we also need to cut traffic volumes um, on our residential roads. So I think, you know, and again, it's another cheap, um, way of, of uh, making making streets more usable for people. And again, so many things become possible if you have a 20 mile an hour limit with regard to regulations, guidance and, uh, 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 and so on. One of the key things which we have to do is get the government to recognise that the whole uh, situation with regard to signage on 20 mile an hour is uh, still based in the 1990s when it was an exception on with a couple of roads here or there in a whole community you know now we've got you know 21 million people living in authorities where they've got a 20 mile an hour default yet we still require these repeater signs and everything every 100 meters to 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 tell us that it's an abnormal speed limit right uh which is which is crazy and that's one of the things which is coming out from the welsh um, initiative which is looking to set a national 20 mile an hour default that you won't need 20 mile an hour repeater signs because that will be the national de uh, default if you've got street lighting it's a 20 mile an hour limit unless it is posted uh, otherwise so again this is all about making it cheaper at becoming the norm uh, uh, and all the benefits which come from that and as i said when isa comes in it will start to make a, a big difference. Every argument which there's been in the past about compliance will be obsolete. It, it really will not be credible once you have ISA uh, in place. Yeah, and I'll back that up. The, the bigger the area, the, the smaller amount of signs. Uh, remember Islington, when they started doing their main roads and then the slightly bigger roads, you had to keep changing the signs every time and it costs like millions in the end to keep redoing it. Whereas if you can just jump to a wide area, you only need a few. We only need like uh, 50 signs to cover inside the M25 in London. Job done. Um, so uh, it can be, uh, can be straightforward. OK, I'll come to Ruth. Uh, I think she had a question. Did you? Ruth? Yeah. Um, very quickly, uh, reinforce what Lucy's just said, but um, Twickenham High Street in London, uh, they took away the bus lane and made it 20 mile an hour on the basis that it would then be safer to cycle. I've got a feeling they did that in Liverpool. If anyone from Liverpool is here, took away bus lanes. Um, what it hasn't, it hasn't done that. It's like a dual carriageway now of all cars, including buses, lorries going at 20 mile an hour and no safe space for cycling. I think the danger is um, 
may have been said already about doing that as if it is the catch-all response. And what we really need is the respect for people walking and cycling. So if someone drives down my road and someone's walking across, they will stop for them, which is what the Dutch do, instead of presuming right of way. So we have to really, that's what the highway code hopefully, you know, pyramid thing is going to alter. So I totally applaud the 20 mile an hour, I wish it was 30K because it's a bit slower, but it also has to be respect for whoever's on the road, the most vulnerable. Bob, did you want to, oh, I can see Bob, why would I put like a, I always say 20 miles an hour is just a base condition for civilization, really. It, it all starts with doing that first step. But go on, Bob. Yeah, Jump. just a quickie. Um, that uh, earlier on, earlier on uh, I uh, did the thing uh, referring to the police and crime commissioner elections. And that is, uh, don't forget our webinar on the 21st where, or not ours, Road Peace and Action Vision Zero, um, that is about police and crime commissioners and will refer to enforcement. And don't forget, some places do enforce 20 mile an hour. Uh, police under Andy Cox were doing that uh, in London and we want to carry on with that. So this is all, this all does fit into the whole thing about policing and enforcement. That's it. Good stuff. Um, any any other questions or comments? Sorry, I looked like uh, someone grabbed the screen and then I got into panic, but then I realised it was just Dave messing with my brain. Um, um, Charles, did you want to come back on something? I know you were keen to... Oh yeah, to... I'm sorry, I was trying to say, uh, is it possible to share a screenshot quickly? Oh, it was you, it was you grabbing the screen, was it? Uh, apologies. No, I was trying to, can you see that or not? No. No, go on, I'll let you share the screen then. I'll let, just asked me beforehand, uh, I got burnt in the past. Um, Sorry, I didn't know how it worked. It's all right, yeah. Do you want to share something? Is it come up? There's my no. screen. Nah. Not yet. Just go to share screen on, on the little green thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, a bit of the newbie at this. Is that better? Uh, yes, that's it, yes. Yeah, th these are uh, number plate recognition cameras made by a company in Norfolk, and I saw them first at uh, Heathrow, and I was impressed. Uh, they, they reduced the speed from 40 to 30, and they're getting average speeds of 29 miles an hour, so they really are hitting the target. Uh, and the camera on the left is £5,000 each, and they're accompanied by about 50 meters ahead, a speed sign. So you see your speed and then you see the camera. Now they are every 500 meters. So there's quite a high density there of them, but they really are getting behavioral change. And I'd postulate that with half a million pounds, you could sort of walk around with up to maybe near, towards a hundred of these sets and hit towns of a population of around a hundred thousand and maybe after six months, get the whole community to behavioral change and move on with that sort of investment. It's not an ISA, it's not an in-car thing, I totally get that, but it, it might have a role to play that sort of relatively low cost kit. And it's tied up with the police force who give warning letters. So you don't get fined with those cameras, you get warning letters and I think third strike, they visit the people and then they'll put you on a national database. So it's all part of the process of behavioural change um, and enforcement. I, I think there's going to be a number of subtle changes here. You, you know, once we have ISA, I, I, I think we'll look back and actually see ISA enable us to identify non-compliers as much more, if you like, the naughty guys, right? And I, and I think that will be something which, which means that initiatives like that with, with the speed cameras will become much more acceptable. The public will see it in terms of fairness. You know, I, I'm now keeping to the speed limits. It, it's fair that we should actually catch those people who, who aren't. And I think that's, that's one of the things which have come out from surveys as, uh, uh, as well. Excellent. Um, yeah, Dave, did you want to come in? I'll start winding it up a little bit now, but it's been uh, 
Yeah. 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 Brian, I'm um, sorry about that. I did actually, it was me. Um, ah. I was, just, I oh, was trying to see what would happen about share screen and it didn't show anything. So I thought, well, I'll just press the button and it flew up. But that was showing how much road space you gain by reducing the speed. Um, a, a three lane, 70 mile an hour carriageway could take four lanes at 20. So, you know, by slowing the traffic down, we get more road space. And in fact, you would actually get room to put cycle cycleways in if you had slower car traffic, because you would gain that, those extra meters in the road width by having narrower lanes. Yeah, highway engineering 101 that, for, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely it's a lovely book it's about 40 years old a paper in germany uh Stadtwerk in wandlung changing changes in town traffic but there's some very useful uh, little tips in it plenty nice. to play to run. i'll put it on my uh christmas list for next year um <laughs> we'll start winding up a little bit now but i will ask uh, rod if he has any like final comments he wants to say before we'll go over to Ruth for a little bit of a last word uh, no, just thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to be here. And, but, but please, I know a lot of you support 20s Plenty uh, campaigns and the, and the campaign uh, 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 overall. Please keep it up because we're winning. I've never felt better right at the beginning of the year than, than this year. And, and, and as we see everybody from the UN right down to parish councils aligning around 20 mile an hour and slower speeds on our community streets uh, to make all of our places better places to be. We're winning, right, and with your support, right, we can really make a difference to the way we can cycle and walk around our, our, our communities. So thank you, know, thank you for all the support which, which, which you've, been, uh, you've been showing. Well, thank you, Rodder. We all know your efforts as well, for sure, everybody on this call. Uh, yeah, Ruth, I'll just go over to you. Have you got any... Uh, last words to us or be rod's done a pretty decent last word effort there i have to say but i'm sure i'm sure you match it this is quite relevant because uh, i'm about to go on to a chiswick area forum meeting and uh, as some of you know we've now got c9 which is the wonderful cycle route that you saw uh, jeremy vine on his um, penny farthing on anyway i sent a question for the police for tonight's chiswick area forum which was about how they were going to um police the new cycle lanes and apparently the police can't be there for operational purposes but the response I got was I saw a question around policing of the cycle lane I can confirm that there will be no specific policing of the cycle lane as this is very low on the policing agenda I wonder what Andy Cox would have to say about that if officers encounter any traffic violations then they are instructed to deal with these proportionately note the word proportionately. So I think we're quite low down on their um, list of who's important.